Okay, so a warm welcome from uh, me. My name is Annette Klinkert. I am the Executive Director of the European Science Engagement Association, UC, and I'm very happy to see you all here on this wonderful sunny day. I think all over Europe, the sun is shining, the weekend is near, so we're appreciating a lot that you all join today's hot pot. And I won't talk much in the beginning, just a few words about what is a hot pot and why in this heaty summer day do we arrange a hot pot. A hot pot is a wonderful Chinese dish in which all participants gather around one large round table and in the middle they will find a boiling pot of soup and the soup gets better with all the ingredients that people add to the dish and the dish is shaped by the people around the table. So whatever your taste is, you just add it, we stir it around, and then in the end, we can enjoy a wonderful dish together. That's the idea behind the UC hot pots. And I'm very happy that today we have a very interesting topic, which my to colleague will now introduce. And I'm handing over to dear Edward Duca, who is a UC board member. I've seen that our UC president, Sissi Asqual, is also joining us from Stockholm. I see our vice president, is here, which is Alexandra Drekun from Serbia. Uh, so we have a really um, high level uh, group of people here. We know a lot of the other colleagues joining from all over Europe. Edward Duca is a board member of UC for many years now, and he's also one of the most engaged uh, science communicators I know in the University of Malta. Uh, and I'm very happy to um, have you with us. And please, Edward, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Annette. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for um, coming. Uh, it's really great to, to see you all. Um, so just to give a bit of background behind this um, uh, hotspot, uh, basically, we, um, we do have an issue in, in um, science communication, really, um, that one of um, preaching to the converted um, or attracting people who are already interested in science. That's something we'd like to discuss more. There's pros and cons towards doing that. Um, however, a lot of the times we, as science com com communicators, we really want to um, involve, engage um, new groups um, and um, introduce them to, to uh, this, this love affair we have of science. Um, that is a topic that can be discussed also, that positivist attitude towards science. And apart from that also, it's um, finding the evidence uh, to, to show that we are being inclusive and diverse and monitoring what, to, what we are doing to identify when we are not so that we can change um, what we're doing and, and, and adapt, which I think the last few years has shown us is key and essential to our work and our resume that also. Um, we've managed to collect um, a great panel of speakers. Um, uh, Professor Eric Jensen, um, I've been working with, with him for a number of years and uh, we're using um, the software him and his team built um, at Quali Analytics in order to be able to do a lot of very interesting comparative studies. If you are interested in that, do get in touch with us. Um, I'd, I'd, I do see that as essential um, when, you know, you need the numbers to get certain um, analysis. Um, and apart from that, um, I'll be talking about our work of science in the city. So you get a bit of numbers and um, inclusivity and diversity. And we also have the Citizen Science Festival um, as well, who will be presenting their there are um, some real world also examples of how to be inclusive and, and diverse, which I think is also really key and important for us to dis discuss. I've probably talked too much. Um, maybe I should hand off back to Chris, um, to, or Chris Stiles is the, the UC officer. Um, he used to work with, with me as well. He's a, a, an, an, an incredible chap. Um, Chris, do you want to take the floor to start uh, off with the icebreakers? Perfect. Thank you very much, Edward. Uh, just an FYI, I'm not sure if it's just me, but uh, I think your connection's a little weak. We, you were flittering a little bit, so I'm not sure if there's anything that you could do in between 
now and when you speak later, just an FYI. Uh, no, thank okay, you very much. I also want to thank a lot uh, Francesca De Pino, who was key in organizing this webinar. No. Just... Uh, no, I'd just like to reiterate my thanks to Fran, who yeah, was a great uh, deal of help when it came to organizing this event. Uh, yes, so this is, welcome to the Hot Pot. Uh, this will be an event in three stages. So we have our contributors from Eric and Edward talking about their research paper on uh, inclusion and diversity and how to use digital and the and the migration onto digital formats, followed by uh, another pair of speakers from the Sicilian Science Festival, uh, Anna and Margisha, who will talk about how the opportunities that COVID uh, allowed them to really reach kind of invisible or underrepresented audiences and how they have been included in their latest science festival. But to start off with, we wanted just to break the ice a little bit and get your brains kind of primed for the uh, for the discussion at hand. So we're going to create some word clouds. Everyone knows these word clouds by now, but uh, yeah, we're gonna be asking you just a, a quick association game with a few key terms that we've been discussing. So uh, Fran, if you could please, uh, we're gonna be doing this on Mentimeter, so pretty easy to get on. So you can either uh, scan the code with your phone or go to menti.com and enter this code. We'll just give you a few moments. If people could give a thumbs up it when they're in, just so we can gauge uh, as a reaction, just so we can gauge how many of us are in. We don't want to be storming off ahead before people are ready. So, Also, the code will be there throughout, so if you do find yourself a little bit lost, you can join us halfway through, but we'll just give a moment or so for people to join. And we have one from Jasic. Thank you. Welcome, Jasic. Da, 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 da. Chris, I can't see it. I only see instructions and a heart, and that's all I see. I cannot enter anything. Uh, oh. think here, can Maybe. you send it? Can you send it in the chat? Because I, I cannot uh, uh, access it through through the. I sent it in the chat. Actually, can you see the message? Yeah. Yes, I tried it in the chat, but it didn't work. It didn't work. It it's not working for me either, guys. Okay. We only see a starting uh, screen, a blank yeah. screen. Uh, Chris, you need. Uh, sorry, Fran, you you need to go to to the next slide. So. Yes, one second. Sorry for the inconvenience. Ah, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, we were waiting for you guys mm -hmm. to join. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so it turns out we need to have started the, started the activity before everyone could see the question. So first of all, we would like to ask you what what words come to mind when you think of science? I know that's a little bit of ambiguous, but we're going to be working towards kind of a common thread. So, uh, yeah, what words do you, what three words come to mind when you think of the word science? Don't worry, they're hidden at the moment. We're going to uh, surprise you with a big, a big cloud of text. So don't worry that if you haven't, have, can't see your words come up just yet, they will come up shortly. You can probably unhide them. That was a really fast re response. <laughs> yeah, oh, there we go. So this is live. So if you still have some contributions or you're still thinking, feel free to add some, but uh, here we go. So some column uh, biggest words there research knowledge curiosity some of this uh, maybe having a look at some of these smaller kind of less uh, less popular but less uh, numerous ones we have methodologies experiments hypotheses so it's kind of a wide we are we have a wide kind of association with science about this knowledge sharing but also the scientific method of uh, using numbers using experiments to develop and work with this knowledge to, 
to enhance our understanding and or, and debunking myths. I see debunking myths, and I think that's a really important one as well, especially in the world we're working with now. So, and hypothesis testing. Uh, we're going to be moving on to the next one, which is very similar again, but what do you think of science communication? How is this different to science? And what different thoughts come to your mind when you think about science communication? So another couple of minutes and then we'll do the same. Uh, this is just to prime your, uh, I'm, going, I'm going into science teacher mode, but in a previous life I did a, I was a science teacher. So I, I'm sorry if I'm uh, slightly uh, simpering to you, but it's just about priming your brain and thinking about what you might want to be, uh, what questions you might want to bring up when our speakers start contributing later. So. Uh, we have three people coming currently have, have submitted their answers. Uh, maybe wait four or five. Here we go. I think Fran, maybe uh, we can probably start showing. So here we go. We have engaging, engaging and fun. Oh, uh, bridge building, which I think goes back to that myth busting kind of aspect we talked about before. So Again, there are links to science, but we always talk about how science communication needs to bridge that gap a little bit. And we can't do that with just facts. We can't do that with just figures. We need to think of ways to really kind of, again, I know it's a bit cliche, but bridge that gap in engaging and in fun ways, but also to make sure that that understanding is that understanding is correct. And that understanding kind of has that stickiness. That's what we talked about in schools, that when you when you share some information, it sticks in people's brains and it sticks there correctly. Uh, just a few more. We have long time learning. Uh, we, a few sort of negatives there, lack of resources, unfortunately. But yeah, hopefully together and with moving into the future, we can try and do what we can to, I don't know, add some more resources to a very important topic. Uh, Thank you very much. And we're moving on to the last question. So what do you think about when it comes to diversity? So in this context, we're thinking of what do you think this means? Does this mean audiences? Does this mean diversity in role models? Does this mean diversity in organizations? What do you think, what are the important kind of term, terms which are related to diversity, do you think? Again, sorry, I'm putting on my teacher voice. I am fully aware of that. We have one. That's trickier. It is a little trickier, yeah. Oh, but we have nine, so I think we can probably start showing these now, Fran. Thank you. So we have inclusion, variety, audiences, self-awareness. Self-awareness, I think, is a very important, is a, a very interesting contribution. Uh, education levels, breaking barriers. So really interesting kind of variety of words. I know diversity is a little bit more of a broader topic. So it's nice to sort of try and link these ideas back to science communication and back to science, kind of going back up the pyramid and then going back down the pyramid. So uh, mutual learning. Uh, or groups. Uh, this has been, yeah, I think quite insightful and we will share these results onto our Padlet later on if people want to and have another look at, uh, if you want to have another look at these and I don't know, have another think about what these words mean to you. So uh, I, unless anyone's got a, I'll give five more seconds for anyone to add their pressing words, but if everyone's finished, I think, ooh, one last one, I'm not sure what it was, politics perhaps. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for taking part. And also we do have our Padlet. So how the, the rest of the, uh, the rest of the discussion will go, we will link back to our speakers. who will have 10 to 15 minutes to talk about their topic with Eric, especially with Eric and Edward. They're going to talk separately for about five, uh, 10, 15 minutes followed by one or two questions that we will stream from the Padlet, which I'll add a link to just now after we introduce Eric. But then after Edward, we're gonna have a joint discussion with Anna and Margasha, and then we'll have some more questions followed by an open discussion. So I just wanna thank you all for taking part. And yes, please do uh, add any contributions to the Padlet or any thoughts or any resources that you know of 
we will then share this Padlet within our network so you can have access to the presentations, yeah. any thoughts, any links. Uh, so yes, first of all, I'd like to pass over to Professor Eric Jensen, Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Warwick, and also an expert in the impact evaluation. He is also the co-founder of the Institute for Methods and Innovation, and along with uh, Edward and a number of other contributors, was the author of uh, the paper, How Moving Public Engagement Online Changes Audience Diversity. So the floor is all yours, Eric. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hi, everybody. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining this important discussion. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, the, a specific research study that we did. And I included in the chat the, um, the link. It looks like this, somebody's uh, mic is on. Yeah, there we go. OK, great. So uh, you, you can have a look at the, the full plus one paper, but um, I'm going to be uh, providing some of the highlights so that we, we can discuss the, the practical implications from this research. Uh, so I'm just going to start by introducing myself a bit, and then I'll get into the, the details of the research that we did. So I'm a social scientist. Uh, I work across a number of different organizations. Uh, at the moment, I'm doing quite a lot of work in the United States as a civic science fellow at the University of Illinois. Um, but I also am a part-time sociology professor at the University of Warwick, uh, and I have a, a nonprofit called the Institute for Methods Innovation, uh, and um, that's uh, kind of the, the range. Um, but for background, I wanted to highlight that where I'm coming from is communication and sociology in terms of disciplinary background, and today, uh, kind of both of these things come together because the communication side uh, science communication. This is something that I've been working on for 20 years, uh, looking at the, the research side of science communication. But uh, sociology highlights the role of difference, diversity, social inclusion. These are kind of core topics within sociology, and that's the kind of particular focus today. So we're kind of, uh, today brings together these two uh, different disciplinary areas quite nicely. Uh, so just to kind of uh, finish uh, giving you a sense of my background, uh, I, I do research that I publish primarily these days in uh, natural science uh, or scientific journals, but uh, historically uh, I publish primarily in journals like Public Understanding of Science. Uh, I do a lot of consulting work um, for UNESCO, government departments, a uh, wide range of institutions. Uh, mainly helping set up impact evaluation frameworks and solutions and then actually conducting uh, public opinion research about public attitudes to science and uh, a variety of things in this domain of science communication and public engagement with research. The background uh, kind of where I see what we're discussing today uh, is as an example of what I've called evidence-based science communication. And this is the direction that I think the field of science communication needs to go, where we integrate insights from research and theory, uh, for example, research and theory about diversity and inclusion, where we have some good evidence where we know what kind of things are effective and what kinds of things are likely to be ineffective. We need to integrate that into practice. And that's not an easy thing to do in science communication or any other field of practice. Uh, the field of medicine has been working on this for quite a while, very explicitly to integrate research and practice. But in most fields, this is still something where there's a big gap between the practices that are kind of widespread and the latest evidence about what's uh, effective approaches. So uh, I think this event is a, a great opportunity to kind of uh, engage with this uh, area of evidence-based science communication. I also wanted to highlight that we've been doing work in this area for a while now. So uh, the, the immediately preceding study to the one that, uh, that I'm going to be presenting is, is this one, um, which was looking at social inclusion indicators in a study across three different countries and a number of different European Researchers Night um, public engagement events and, um, and looking at the issues of social inclusion. But today, uh, the study I'm going to be presenting is a specific focus on the shift from 
the kind of offline public engagement with research events that pre-COVID were the norm and the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic kind of forced a move online. And this um, obviously was quite traumatic, but it did create a research opportunity in the sense that we had a kind of naturalistic experiment, uh, or at least naturalistic comparison between the offline kind of public engagement and online public engagement for exactly the same events. So uh, we were already lined up to be doing these evaluations. We already conducted an evaluation using the same methods in 2019, uh, pre-pandemic. And then we found ourselves with, um, with European Researchers Night public engagement events that were now online. So we were using uh, equivalent methods, which then allowed us to compare between the, the two years to see what were the, what were the differences. And so let, I'm going to start by kind of framing what we would expect the differences to be with the move online. Um, so the, this data was collected from Malta and Ireland, um, two, two locations in Ireland, and then um, the Malta event that you'll hear more about from Edward uh, right after this. So in the research literature, the, the use of digital technologies, there's a concern that the use of digital technologies increases uh, social exclusion, that because you, you require kind of expensive equipment and uh, things to be able to access uh, digital technologies, and because it's expensive to have faster digital technology, for example, for, uh, for broadband that's gonna be fast enough to stream video from an event, uh, for these kinds of reasons, the default expectation uh, based on the research literature would be that a move online would increase the level of social exclusion, that you would get a less inclusive audience if you move online. So the hypotheses that we were investigating in this evaluation started from the idea that moving these events online would mean that we get a more exclusive audience. So one that has higher educational attainment. So educational attainment is one of the indicators of socioeconomic status. So there's a very strong correlation between educational status and other things like income, uh, the kind of social class. So it's, it's for a single item, it's about as good as you can get for social class uh, indicators. And then the second hypothesis is that, uh, or was that there would be greater levels of subjective economic well-being uh, for the the uh, online audiences. So the the we have these two measures for uh, for socioeconomic status, and we predicted based on the existing literature that both of those would be getting a more exclusive audience with online. Um, in the hypotheses. And then we looked at this using the survey methods that we applied both in the offline and the online context, and then ran analyses to see what kind of differences there were between the two. And we uh, this is the kind of uh, the sample that we collected. We had um, reasonably good response rates for participating in the, in the survey and reasonably large sample sizes to be able to run this kind of comparison, particularly because we're looking here at demographic data, which is something that we collect in the pre-visit survey where we, we tend to have more participants uh, in the pre-visit survey uh, than stick with us to the, the post-visit survey. So looking at the demographic pattern, you can see in the 2019 results, um, you want to look at the percentages especially, um, and then compared to the 2020 results, you can see that there were some differences. And the differences were basically that the, the pattern was kind of a, a bifurcated pattern. So we had an increase, uh, quite a substantial increase in those with no formal qualification participating. They were, uh, almost non-existent in the offline event to have somebody with no formal qualifications participating. And the, the, they were still underrepresented in 2020 with the online event, but 
uh, a substantial increase. And then at the other end of the spectrum, those with master's and PhD, the postgraduate level qualifications were even more overrepresented in the 2020 um, case with the online move. So here we see kind of the, the two ends of the spectrum. So the, they both went up. So that's a kind of um, complicated, nuanced result as opposed to like a clear um, pattern one way or the other. And this is the kind of summary result here. And we kind of were able to look at this compared to national populations. The bottom line is that as we found in prior research, there is uh, an issue with kind of overrepresentation of people with higher educational attainment in these public engagement events. Uh, we found that that issue stayed into the online context, but it, the pattern shifted a bit. So we had this kind of greater representation from those with, with no educational qualifications. And that was the most striking finding. Uh, and then the, you can see on the, on the far right column, uh, the difference column, you can see this kind of bifurcation where at the low end of the, of the number for qualifications, the numbers went up and in Malta, they went up uh, considerably. Um, and then at the high end, they also went up. And then in the middle uh, is where the reduction was. And then the other way we, oops, the other way we had to measure socioeconomic status was to ask people about whether they felt they could meet their needs, their kind of um, daily needs. So a kind of self-reported level of economic well-being. And on this measure, we found a slight increase. Uh, so we found more people saying they could meet all of their needs or more. So a, a higher percentage of people in that category in the 2020 data, the online responses than when compared to the 2019. So uh, a modest shift uh, towards people who felt more, more well off. So the bottom line is the kind of um, digital divide hypothesis. That's the main literature that um, that's available for saying what effect the shift online should have. That digital divide hypothesis was not supported because we had this more nuanced uh, kind of complicated pattern where there was an increase in participation rates both for the super highly educated and for those with no educational qualification. So that's, uh, that's a kind of surprising finding, we, we did not anticipate it. And then on the subjective economic well-being measure, we found very weak support for the hypothesis, uh, mainly because the effect size, so the percent of variance explained was very small for, for this pattern. So there was a very small effect um, on, on this point, but this was more in line with what we expected uh, was people who are um, more well off participating online. So the bottom line here is that there's still, uh, whether it's offline or online, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of um, widening participation and diversifying participation. Um, in this case, we're focusing on socioeconomic status. Um, and it also highlights that there is some potential with online, uh, that we can't assume that because online involves more digital technologies, that that means it's going to be more exclusive. It's a, it was a more complicated pattern than that. And in particular, the introduction of at least some significant minority of people who had no educational qualifications, that's quite a noteworthy accomplishment and, um, and finding for them to kind of uh, suddenly appear in the sample uh, in that particular year when there was the shift online. Okay, that's, uh, that's my presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, that was very insightful. Uh, we have a time for one or two questions. Uh, I've seen that uh, some comments and questions have been answered by Edward as we go along, but we did have quite an interesting contribution from 
Eva, I don't know if you want to present it yourself or I can read it out. I have added it to the Padlet as well, but. Well, uh, I, I can't read it out. Hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. It was interesting. This uh, diversity and inclusion uh, issues are really the kind of thing one, one wants to hear about. So I was wondering, uh, 2020 was the time from with when COVID started and we were in many places, we were all under lockdowns. So people had more time and probably they were bored. So they tried out things that they usually didn't do, some at least. So it would be nice to know if, if these kind of patterns uh, stay now where people are allowed to go to the street as well. So things are good. Yeah. I agree with you. It would be uh, it would be nice to know um, whether the findings persist, uh, whether COVID is a special time. I mean, what um, what this does demonstrate is the principle that um, moving online I mean uh, more exclusive audiences, as would be hypothesized based on the existing literature. So it shows there's potential. Whether that potential will be as easy or straightforward to realize in a um, post-COVID context uh, is uh, an important follow-up question, of course. Because I, I wanted to tell you about a little short uh, experience we had uh, on, on that year as well. I was collaborating with another European project. It was about uh, co-creation uh, in, in industry. And uh, at that time, we, we had to do some co-creation labs, but we had to move them online because because of the situation. And this turned out to become a great opportunity because uh, we managed uh, to do something much easier than expected, which was uh, involving uh, families from low income uh, backgrounds. So this, this doing things online, it gave them the opportunity to decide because we didn't do them uh, everybody at the same time. So they were allowed to do their stuff any time of the day they wanted to. And this gave them freedom and, and, and the opportunity to organize themselves and to involve all members of the family, not only the mothers and the children, but also the fathers. So they were able to discuss at dinner and so on. And uh, so yes, I think uh, moving things online gives the opportunity for to people who usually have uh, less opportunities. So I, I think that's something we have to pursue. And now I shut up. Sorry. Thanks very much for the for that comment. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Eva and Eric. Uh, unless there's any pressing questions, of course, we do have the open discussion at the end of these contributions. Uh, I'll move, we'll move on to Dr. Edward Duca, who, uh, science, who is a science communicator and innova innovations lecturer at the University of Malta, but also uh, is lead coordinator for a number of science communication projects based in, e uh, based within Malta and across the EU, including uh, the STEAM Summer School, uh, which is uh, located in Malta, but also SciCultured, uh, a, co a collaborative effort across, uni across Europe to bring science, art, and entrepreneurship together. And of course, uh, the Science in the City Festival, which is the largest of its type in Malta. And the topic of, uh, part of the topic of uh, their research, and yeah, Edward's just going to talk about some of the findings of that research and how we could possibly use them in the future to promote inclusion and diversity. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Edward. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for the lovely introduction. Um, so uh, how can we make SciCom more inclusive and diverse? Um, that's, that's, that's the question I'm, post I'm postulating here. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail about, about th that. Um, I'd, I'd like to give you a bit more context to the um, research that uh, Professor Jensen was showing you. Uh, and that's the Science in the City Festival. So um, uh, it's more the Science in the Earth Festival. It's um, part of European Researchers Night. Um, and uh, we win um, the EFFE label. This is for cultural festivals. So we, we try and com communicate basically good, good um, 
research, but also to do it uh, with, with good art. We can discuss <laughs> the word good in place in this way. But um, we also in 2021 won the National um, STEM Awards in, uh, in Malta that are run by Explorer, the Interactive Science Center. Um, so um, this is um, what, uh, what happened in 2019. We were around the Triton Fountain. Um, this is a 1950s recently restored um, uh, fountain, basically. Um, and uh, it is the gateway to Malta's capital city. Malta's capital city is only a, a couple of kilometers long. Um, Malta is a very tiny place. It's 27 kilometers long in its entirety as a country and has about half a million people on it. Uh, in, in 2019, we, we had, as you can see, all these interactive events. There's no masks. There's, uh, um, you know, you can see a lot of kids. But apart from this, our surveys show that around half of the people coming are also um, teenagers, pensioners, or adults coming without their children. Um, we, we try to make everything as hands-on and, and entertaining as possible. There's theater, there's dance, puppets, um, there's a, a huge variety of things. Um, uh, the concept obviously being something something for everyone, right? And to try and hit multiple audiences in this way. So this, for example, the, the one you just show is a more adult audience, a more classic um, talk. Um, so uh, the beauty of it is you've got um, all, all this cutting edge tech, tech, tech technology with a, a historical 400 year old uh, background. Just some examples of our artworks. This is back in 2012 when we started. Um, this was based on, on DNA, um, dance performance, I think in 2019 actually, um, inspired by um, ADHD and neurodiversity issues. Um, this was a mathematics and science and, and faith um, as well. Um, so we which do try and um, be as, as interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary as, as possible. Um, here, probably um, based on the, the question that was asked in the, in the chat, um, there, there was uh, a question about um, how we were advertising the event. Uh, we always advertise the event um, on social media. Uh, Malta has a huge Facebook penetration rate of um, above 60% of the entire pop pop population. Um, when you put a, a, a social media that is basically based on, on gossiping <laughs> and people being able to see what other people are doing, that works really, really, really well on an island. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we used to attract um, around 30,000 people, which is around five to six percent of the pop population. So we're, we're, um, that is, is more than we ever um, expected. Um, right. So then COVID hit. We shifted to more video content. We focused more um, on our social media platforms. And we reduced the amount of real world PR because newspapers weren't so much in circulation. Something we did, which I'm, I'm pretty proud of, is, is a campaign. Um, I think Chris actually edited this, this video. Um, was, a, was a campaign um, that, uh, called uh, Meet the Researcher. And we had researchers talking about um, themselves, the, the, the human aspect, the, the research aspect of, of who they are. And this, this actually got us a lot of engagement. Um, it was shared by about five other European researchers night. If you are running a European researchers night and you want to be part of this network, do get in touch, send me an email afterwards. Um, it works really well when we share each other's stuff. Basically, we had about 70,000 uh, reach. Um, I'm forgetting the engagement level. Um, and thank you, Vary, for that kind comment. Vary, Vary Stewart was one of the key proponents of bringing these um, European researchers' nights together. Um, okay, so how did we go digital? Uh, we basically ran a three-day festival. We were basically worried that no one would come. So we we're like, okay, we can't just do one night of this. We have to do um, longer. 
So, and also we had about uh, 40, 50 organizations wanting to work with us still. That was half the amount of pre-COVID numbers, but it was still a, a lot and a lot of content. The beauty of, of going digital meant that we could actually um, have things being recorded in London, like dances and stuff that we, we, we funded as a festival. Um, uh, the being recorded, pre-recorded and then shown live and having discussions with people in three, four, five different locations. We also wanted to show a bit of a real world feeling to it. We had discussions in the studio itself. As you can see, everyone was following COVID-19 rules. Uh, that was essential for us to give that, that value system as a festival. Um, and um, you, you, it, it was very, very well received. We got about 20,000 views, a lot of them on, on Facebook. The, um, so as you can see over there, our, our reach was um, 400,000. Um, level of engagement was, was, was pretty high. Um, the Live Virtual Festival had um, over 20,000 minutes viewed. So we were, were really, really happy with that. We also increased the number of pre-festival again events. Um, we went a bit over the top, uh, but it resulted in, a, in, in, in quite a good um, engagement also. Um, okay, so some, some questions to raise a discussion here. Um, first, first of all, some other things. So when we started getting in the data that like, ah, um, a lot of the people who are coming are already interested in science or um, a lot of people who uh, are coming are actually not from Valletta. So we wanted to um, have then specific projects targeted to those groups. Um, we started in 2018 with this. Um, COVID was a bit of a big setback, especially with the Vucci et Beltin project, although I heard yesterday that we won the funds to run it. So um, uh, we're very, very happy about that. That idea, for example, um, we were working with a social scientist in Malta. Um, that is something I completely recommend. Work with people who are already engaging those com communities. This person worked on the Valette 2018 uh, European Capital of Culture, who was examining the, com the communities in Valletta. Even in such a small place, there are four different com communities that he identified. And he helped introduce us to a theater group um, that's part of a church uh, in, in Valletta, that runs the Easter pageant. And also we engage the school. Schools are easy for a science and arts festival because we're known to be um, school friendly. So we're, we're, we've already gotten them to work together, but now because of the funding, we can take it a step, a step further. And actually as a festival, give them what they wanted. They wanted us to train them. They wanted um, us to give them Wi-Fi. Um, you know, these, um, and we worked hard to get the funding to be able to, to match their needs based on the, the meetings we had um, uh, with them. Um, we also have run projects. We're currently running one called Equal by Nature, which is involving minority groups uh, and refugees as well. And we've run other ones also to, to try and, um, and encourage it that the problem we have with these things is scaling them. Like we managed to engage, you know, 10, 20, 30, they're highly engaged, but scaling them into a festival size, um, we, we haven't figured out yet. Um, this is a conversation I had with uh, Eric and his brother Aaron um, about, about, about this issue when we started to see these results come in. Um, uh, I remember Eric mentioning, based, based on his research, that the zoos are more inclusive, so there's learning there. Uh, apart from that, sports events, um, you know, there's concepts out there like com community engaged arts, which I mentioned with the Vujit Belt Belt Team project, uh, co-design and co-creative processes. So, or obviously, many of us are already using the citizen science approach as well. Um, but how do we develop uh, more models and, and share them within our com community? Uh, probably the people attending this event are already the people who are uh, doing this. <laughs> so how do we get um, those um, other thousands of science communicators um, around the world to, to, to find 
uh, this as a pertinent topic and, uh, and for us to develop this knowledge is my key question. Okay, so my 10 minutes are up and I'm going to um, go to our questions. Chris, let me stop sharing. Uh, thank you very much, Edward, for that contribution. Uh, I have a question myself, to be perfectly honest, so I'm sorry. Uh, the perks of being moderator is I can get to uh, butt in my question. Uh, how? So you talk about the engagements that happened online uh, and how well like the social media campaigns worked and how many people visited and viewed and watched. How, what is the comparison like, is it comparing apples to oranges, comparing a person visiting a stand in person and talking to a researcher versus someone, I'm being slightly naysay, I'm just playing devil's advocate, but uh, someone having it on in the background or using it as background noise to maybe entertain mm. their children as they're preparing dinner or something along those yeah. lines. So a lot of the views we got were from Facebook uh, in, in Malta, and those people were watching for... Um, um, one to five minutes. Uh, that's that's how long you've got the the audience for. Uh, you do get those people who stay for the whole show. For example, um, uh, when we were running our shark uh, shark lab, it's an NGO. Um, they did. Uh, we live streamed this video, um, 500 days in the life of a shark, beautifully shot. Then they in our studio they were showing. Um, uh, the, the jaws of sharks, talk, talking about them and so on. The amount of questions we got, actually, um, I, I was answering them because I was uh, immobile. I couldn't do much in the studio. I can go into that if people want. Uh, uh, so I was on the Zoom chat uh, replying to, pe to people. And uh, we actually needed to follow it up through on social media to be able to answer people's questions because the level of engagement was so, so, so high. Um, that, that's obviously not the case with every, every um, show. Like when we did the online festival last year, we're so focused on going back into the real world with our shows and so on, that we didn't prioritize the online. And that didn't work very well. Um, in fact, we saw an increase in the level of, um, of disappointment. So the hybrid situation um, didn't work so well. And in fact, this year, I want our team to focus. OK, you're the online team. You're the indoor um, show team. You're the um, streets festival team. Um, and we're, we're, we're hoping that increases the level of engagement. Uh, Chris, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, uh, it sounds quite difficult, I imagine. It's like running three festivals at once, I suppose. And, uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. That's, and that's a call to our funders then to realize that, which is another I was just going issue. to say, yeah, if you're running three festivals and having to do online content, in-person content, yeah. skin content, yeah, that must be yes. a real struggle. Yeah, and I don't think it really works when you've just got a camera facing a real world event. You need, when you, the online stuff needs to be treated as its own as its own beast, really. Um. Uh, we did have a comment. Oh, Barry, I was just about to uh, come to you about your question that you made previously, but I'm not sure if that's to, if this question is in regards to that or not. It's not actually. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just um, really impressed at the amount of interaction you got, Edward, from uh, questions being sent to you from video type stuff and I wondered if you had to do a lot of work beforehand to raise awareness in order to mm. encourage people to ask questions and of course did that translate across many different activities or just the really I mean sharks high profile I can understand that in a way yeah we we work a lot on our marketing uh, it, it, it's um I, th I think marketing is, is really important for these type of events. Uh, a lot of people need to know about them for them to come. We sent out a lot of teasers. Uh, you know, if they had, we're going to show video content, we'd take a snippet from that content and, and publish that uh, to get people to start thinking, to start wanting to be to be part of the festival. I think that is that is a key point. So we did work very hard. Um, 
when it came to um, what happens beforehand. It's not just um, organizing the event. It's um, you, you need to work hard to get pe people interested. Um, sh sharks are an easy one, um, but, but then there, there can be other topics which are um, uh, don't capture the public imagination as well. But obviously, you know, we have researchers at uh, in Malta doing that research and supporting research. Uh, so you need to find creative ways of com of communicating that. Um, uh, when, when it came to um, the, because I'm seeing your your comment about the to meet the researcher, um, that 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 also took a lot of work to coordinate, but it was very rewarding. And this is what I encourage people to do: um, invest your time in the things that are giving you a, a good return on investment essentially and that requires us to always keep thinking about you know what do we do that we want to keep that we know works really well what do we want to allow time for to develop new new things to allow the opportunity to um, create uh, things that we don't really know how they're going to uh, engage with uh, otherwise you'll never be surprised with what you do uh, thank you for your question, Barry, and thank you, Edward. Uh, there is going to be time later on. Uh, we are running slightly over, but we do have plenty of time still for our next pair of contributors who are going to be presenting together and presenting something slightly different to what Eric and Edward were talking about. So next we are joined by uh, Margisha Bilnik and Anna Narot from the University of Sicilia and also the uh, coordinators with this uh, Sicilian Science Festival. Who are going to be talking about how they how they use the opportunity of COVID? I know uh, it's a bit of a naughty word still, uh, COVID, but it did as for the kind of hardships people went through. It did give people opportunities to sh to change up how how uh, oh, sorry, a Sicilian, Sicilian uh, not Sicilian. Sorry, uh, sorry about that. But yes, they're going to be talking about how they use uh, the situation, the COVID pandemic, to reach different social dimensions and to uh, engage and with audiences who are commonly overlooked or perceived as invisible to uh, the general public. So thank you very much for joining us, both of you. Thank you very much for introduction. Yes. Okay, I will show you. This is the photo from January 2020, uh, the fourth Silesian Science Festival. I think the photo on the left is from the wash hours of the festival. Yes, and, exactly. And from the right, you see the team in the evening. You are the part of the team, yes? Yes, yes. I'm on the left side of the photo. And uh, then nobody believed in Poland about. Uh, nobody knew how uh, new, dan new danger virus will influence on our life. But I heard that at night, yeah, finishing this festival, you read about the new virus. Yes, yes, and it was um, shocking at, at that point, but uh, I also want to say that the fourth edition was truly amazing and one of the largest we uh, had so far. Uh, we had over 50,000 guests throughout three days of festival and uh, so so yes yes that mm. is something something really unique and all we knew that we cannot organize the same festival in 2021 we have to figure out something new because for all over one year everybody was working online we are in lockdown and it was absolutely impossible to invite so many people uh, to indoor festival and we have to organize something new. Of course we thought about online science festival and we get more days of festivals. We have five days instead of two. Uh, we had uh, 87 online lectures and 63 online interactive workshops and what we found out that it was very good that we were able to invite on these workshops people all over the Poland. So it was a kind of uh, good influence. But on the other hand, in the end of 2021, we were really missing to meet people. We knew that we cannot do the same 
in online virtually because we want to meet people and we want to share with them our enjoyment of, of, of showing the knowledge and science. And we have decided to organize the outdoor festival. You see some photos from our outdoor festival. It was the first experience of outdoor event uh, for us. But uh, when we have decided to organize this uh, festival in the center of Katowice, we knew it's not only uh, a lot of advantages that it will be much easier to get so many people and to get the interest, but it will be also a challenge because in the in this district, in the center of Katowice, there was a, also a problem with people in a crisis of homelessness. And we knew that we have to face this crisis, this challenge, and that they will come on our festival because they actually live in this area. It's, it's their home. So Małgosia, you were the first person who noticed this challenge and who think about the solution. Yes, um, I one of uh, the this uh, this person that we uh, like already knew that uh, they the homeless people would come up, and we already uh, also knew that we don't want to give them only like comfort space or cherish them for a minute, uh, but we want to bring up that feeling that they also uh, welcome they also our audience so. Um, uh, how uh, we uh, did it. Uh, first, first of all, we didn't have to do it by ourselves. We contact and uh, after that con uh, collaborate, collaborate with uh, municipal uh, social uh, welfare center in Katowice and local NGOs uh, because they had um, know-how. Uh, they had also social and street workers to provide professional help. And we, uh, in other hand, provide uh, necessary space, a uh, legal and psychological team to consult uh, people they need to. And also we help with exhibition that we, visualization you may see on this slide in uh, round down, uh, down the right uh, corner. Uh, uh, but um, that 11 street workers overall uh, provide at the first day of festival uh, support and help to 66 homeless people. And um, that was not only that, because we want to um, like invite those people to festival activities and these social workers and street workers uh, accompanied them, uh, encouraged them to um, uh, be part of festival and that was like one purpose for the inclusion zone but there was only uh, also uh, another one because uh, this uh, zone also um, we want to to be a place that our regular participants want to get some knowledge about a uh, home, homelessness uh, crisis issue to um, be a place when, where they uh, can uh, share uh, experience with the social workers and the social workers could um, speak about they, uh, their insight from their job. Uh, and uh, we can say that Inclusion Zone work both for homeless people and for the local uh, communities. Uh, I think it really was a very good job because I was a coordinator of one zone in this festival and it was the first uh, festival, a free festival in the center of Katowice without a problem of uh, uh, violence and, and guests who are not welcomed yeah, because yes. they are destroying. So it was what I have seen that, that they were really equal and nobody see any problems. It was the outcome, I think. Yes, yes. that was the best part of it. But we also knew that there was also one more group we would like to really integrate in uh, this festival, uh, people with disabilities. I will point you two data which really show how big uh, exclusion uh, from employment and from access to education is for people with disabilities 
this are data from Poland from 2017, but it showed the gap that employment rate in Poland was the 65%, but for people with disabilities, in population with disabilities, only 26%. Uh, access to higher education, 39% for whole society and 10% well-educated people with disabilities. And we knew that we'd like to make a first step to make this science and education accessible for people with disabilities. We have asked this question to people with disabilities. What can we do for you to make our festival equal, accessible for you, to feel to, that you feel welcome there? Uh, the first group was people with uh, riding on a wheelchair, and it was much very very easy to answer because we knew that the whole infrastructure has to be wheel friendly, yeah, and accessible for wheel the pathways, but also stages for uh, lectures on the wheels and audience and workshop toilets food courts everything, but we knew that. Not every person uh, who has mobile uh, disability has a uh, riding wheelchair. So we also thought about kind of uh, green local transport dedicated uh, for festival. So people who had problem with walking had support uh, to move from one point to another. And it was very important for everybody, for people with kids, and, and of course, uh, difficulties with walking long distance. And we were also thinking about place to relax and sit down because many people spent a lot of hours on our festival. But then uh, we knew that people with uh, problem with walking, it's not the only group of people who are excluded from, uh, from this kind of, who could be excluded from this kind of festival. And we have asked people with uh, hard of hearing problems uh, uh, if the technology they use is enough for them to be full equal participant of a festival. And they said, no, uh, we need something uh, extra, not our in cochlear implants or hearing aid is not enough. So we have dedicated for them 11 stages with induction loops and also induction loops in InfoDesk. But uh, they also suggested us that some people, even a big group of people, uh, do not even know how this kind of technology uh, works. So they need a kind of help desk, info desk, where they could get a knowledge how, they, uh, how their um, personal uh, hearing aid uh, can um, be comparative to induction loops. So it was a kind of showing the knowledge and experience. And we are very, uh, we really uh, would like to provide uh, subtitles in each multimedia we are providing on our festival and also live text access. Sometimes it's difficult because there was a lack of specialists in Poland, uh, but we know uh, that it is very, very important that everybody what is say, said uh, uh, from the stage should be also written in subtitles so everybody could understand the lecture. But we knew there was also a group of people uh, who doesn't speak uh, Polish or our language but use the sign language. So we have provided uh, sign language interpreters, not only on a stage but also uh, a group of sign language interpreters who could lead the interests of uh, uh, people and uh, so the people with uh, deaf people could participate in workshops and in interactive uh, activities. As about accessibility for people with visually impaired people from blind people, uh, yes, we're taking attention putting attention on this. We were consulting a lot of solution with uh, for mobile applications and web content. Uh, it was very difficult because the uh, festival was very big and, uh, and it, everything was changing a lot. But we knew that when we are consulting uh, this accessibility with uh, people who are 
blind or uh, visually impaired, we are day by day better. And uh, we are consulting it and we knew what can be wrong and what can be better. As I have told you, we developing the accessibility of our festival, we, uh, we, we get the knowledge that we are never accessible enough. So uh, one of uh, DevBlind consultants, you can see him on the photo, uh, it's, uh, he, he trained, helped us train, uh, to train uh, the assistants. So we had about 15 volunteers who were assistants on this festival and supported people with disabilities to participate in this event on equal level. And it was a very, very good idea because they really uh, were more uh, free and, and, and equal participants. Here you can see the photo from the stage, uh, one stage in our festival. On the right corner now, you can see the pictogram on induction loop. So people with hearing, hard of hearing people could hear uh, everything was uh, on the lecture. You can see the woman who is translating the lecture uh, on uh, sign language. Uh, you can see uh, the lecturer. He is a deafblind person and he couldn't get to the stage without the assistant. So it was a very crucial point to have a group of assistants. And uh, you can see also on the left the ramp. Uh, so each uh, stage in our festival was accessible for people on wheelchair. Uh, find a very important group, and uh, somebody gets uh, my attention that this is uh, really the most invisible group of, of people with disabilities. So people with cognitive uh, disability, they are so in invisible that they do not have even uh, their own uh, pictogram, as you see on the bottom but they are a very important group for us. Why? Because if some uh, lectures, if some workshops are accessible for people uh, uh, with cognitive disability who has actually problem with understanding, uh, it means that the lecture is good because we want to speak about science, about difficult things easily and uh, they help us with this knowledge, if something is easy enough or difficult, uh, too difficult to understand. So we are also cooperating with this kind of consultant. Uh, finally, during this process of uh, consulting, uh, we noticed that uh, people with disabilities have a very big part of knowledge we do not have. So we invited them to show their knowledge, to show their experience, to show what does it mean to be uh, disable and to show uh, what kind of assist, uh, as, assistive technologies they use, uh, what kind of innovation they use, how how they, the the science is uh, can help them and science and innovation. So on our festival, you could ride a wheelchair, you could uh, participate in a sport, uh, sports for blind people. The two pictures on the left corner. Uh, are about sports for accessible for blind people. And you could also use assistive technologies for deaf, deaf blind and, uh, and blind people. Finally, I will show you something that is very important for us. On the right, you see Rafał. Uh, he is, of course, deaf person who was participating in our festival. And he told us something amazing, that it was the first time he didn't feel disabled. He felt equal. He had uh, an interpreter uh, who lit his interests. And uh, I would like to tell you that the feedback and the dialogue is very important. Uh, now we know that we are still not accessible enough, but we have very good consultant. Uh, who help us to developing the knowledge. And we are really aware uh, for everyone, uh, each participant of our festival. Uh, Małgosia, can you share with us what we are planning for the next edition? Of course. Uh, so um, that was last year, but unfortunately for every each of us, the world didn't stand in a place and we barely manage a COVID pandemic and uh, suddenly we have to cope with 
war in Ukraine. And so uh, everything has to change. And we also uh, in this year, uh, again, back uh, indoors. So uh, inclusion zone have to transform to some safe space. And we uh, choose to name it inclusion stage this time. Uh, because of the uh, situation that is uh, situation in, in the world, we want to create, like I said, safe space of uh, open dialogue to our audience when we can talk about uh, issues and problems that experience in uh, that we have a common experience and uh, we want to bring up to um, this idea that we can share from both perspectives science and also human uh, experience so we want to talk about uh, inclusion we want to talk about uh, refugees issues crisis uh, about war, um, identity uh, forming, uh, human uh, rebuilding human bonds, uh, diversity, um, and um, uh, isolation, uh, for example. So it is at some level idea when we um, we have to uh, really prepare for and many things could change to December, uh, but we uh, really think that that inclusion stage is something that people need uh, at this point and that space when you can share your uh, experience, your anxious, your fears, uh, it's really, uh, it's gonna be really helpful for, for everybody. And uh, to sum up, uh, I want to share something with all of you. Uh, so when I first saw the title of today's meeting, I thought, okay, right? So I have barely nothing to say about the topic because uh, both inclusion zone and inclusion stage uh, are projects that gave and will give us a face-to-face -face experience, not the online one. But uh, uh, after a while, I understand that uh, it isn't most important thing um, how we choose to connect with others. The most important thing from my perspective is that uh, how with um, an approach we uh, choose to communicate and what we have uh, during communicate with others. So uh, the most important features that I think we should embrace either off-site or on-site uh, are sensitivity and uh, maybe better word will be vulnerability because let's be honest, not always contact and communication with other people is pleasant thing. Sometimes it's unpleasant and this is part of life but we uh, have to be prepared for it. Uh, we have to be aware of others, also aware of ourselves, the self-awareness that is something can uh, uh, that uh, show us our abilities and also our uh, limits. So, uh, so it is here also for us. And um, at least we have to be compassionate. We have to be empathetic to um, be for other people, to reach them out, to understand them, and to show them that science is indeed for everybody. So that will be all for, from us today. Thank you very much. That uh, just goes to show like you're doing so much and making uh, these sort of events accessible to, just making them accept making them accessible makes it accessible to everyone and like there's no apart from finding the resources to do this it, there's no downside to making these sort of events more accessible to everyone so i think a uh, lot to a lot of people in the comments just kind of commending all the great work you've done uh uh over the last well with the last festival so uh just going to see if there's any questions uh uh just 
yeah, just lots of people uh, are giving a lot of positive messages about the work that you've done so far. Uh, this is, uh, I'd like to open up the board for anyone, oh, uh, for anyone who would like to answer a question. So if you'd like to just raise your hand, uh, yes, you can either, uh, we can pose some questions. Oh, we have a question. From Aneta. Hello, Aneta. Yeah, hi. It's it's not really a question. I really want to, to applaud you all for the work you're doing. I think it's really, really amazing. Both the work you do to include a lot of audiences into your festivals um, on the site, but also digitally. I remember the first hot pot we did was on moving science festivals online. And there was this sense of irritation and despair and loss. And we don't know what to do. And we are not good at online. And now we see all these kinds of new things uh, emerging. And um, I I always admired the Salishian Science Festival and now I do it even more because I think you reach out to the audiences that none of us would have had uh, on the spot, like the homeless people, not seeing them as objects to study only and talk about in sociology seminars, but really um, uh, showing their homes and inviting them themselves and really offering also support to the trainers, which I also like a lot, so that you train your um, uh, the people that, that work in the festival, make them aware of the people's needs. So I'm really impressed and I, um, I wish we can include all of this in upcoming talks. Um, um, I was in Paris together with Alexandra Dracoon a few weeks ago, where we um, discussed an international year of science engagement together with Falling Walls. Um, and there was someone from the commission, Lucy Swan. She was planning the future of the European Researchers' Night. And she was interested in working with UC with this community of practitioners who can bring in all these wonderful experiences. And I think you would be uh, best examples on where this format could be going. So instead of simply repeating our festivals, just to show th these people in Brussels, this is where we need to go and to really bring in uh, um, your festivals. And I think this is uh, the step we will definitely do. And congratulations again. This is really an amazing work and a role model for all of us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Aneta, for those words. Uh, we did have a question from earlier in the conversation that just kind of got lost in, uh, from Albert. Uh, uh, I don't know if Albert wants to contribute now or if I, I can read it out if needs be. Uh, do we have Al Albert with us still? Yes. Oh, 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 oh. hello. Sorry about that. Let me put on the video here. Uh, it wasn't really a, uh, a question I uh, w wanted to... Uh, put forth, but um, I recognize the importance of the situation which is happening in Ukraine. And what will be more important is what we do afterwards. Uh, this is where I believe uh, we as scientists, researchers, uh, we have different experiences. Uh, and hopefully with the uh, help of some uh, funding from the EU, uh, considering how much uh, money is or, and funding is already going to uh, Ukraine, we're thinking ahead. Um, I believe that uh, each country can make a major, uh, a major role in the situation and uh, help the Ukrainians and also the millions of people who have uh, been displaced and who will need our help. Uh, even considering that Ukraine is uh, asking to join the EU. Uh, Poland, which is very close to Ukraine, uh, would play, I think, a very uh, crucial role in this, uh, in terms of uh, the the uh, coordination of how this could be done. And um, so, although this is very early, but I think that uh, if we start to think about this, I know Edward uh, fairly well. I live here in Malta, uh, and to, to uh, discuss this in the future. I think uh, this could really multiply what we could do here as a hot pot. Thank you. We can show what we have done because we had some activities 
just after the uh, when the war uh, came up. Uh, well, first was of course help, and we, as we were, sub, uh, our university was uh, was uh, collaborating with with um, some Ukrainian universities. We helped a lot of scientists to come here and to uh, get some job and a lot of students and their families. But we knew that we also need a kind of uh, support for our local community. So I think that 25th of March, we have organized uh, an event which was called City of Science for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were addressing it not only for, for uh, from people from Ukraine who came here to, to maybe show the experience of knowledge and to uh, provide some translators and to, to do this kind of activities, but also to support the community to cope with this uh, difficult situation for us. Uh, so we had some debates, uh, we had uh, some activities, some workshop, some uh, productions of, of movies, and, and we really uh, knew that scientists, especially social scientists, has to help uh, local society to cope with this Absolutely. situation. And it was a kind of first step and we would like to maybe do something more, uh, but we, we are still thinking about it, but we are having our, our festival in December and we would like to, to do both, yeah? To, to help people from Ukraine, get include our society but also to to talk about this difficult uh, topic absolutely i i think that uh, we even uh, acting as a think tank here we can uh, put together hundreds of ideas and uh, then uh, discuss how to apply them since uh, all our um, suggestions, our uh, experience can make a significant uh, contribution to uh, the cause after the, uh, the, 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 the situation in Ukraine. And um, I, I see this uh, as a, uh, a magnificent uh, possibility uh, that we, even we as scientists can uh, expand uh, this hot pot and with other universities and uh, also the European administration. And uh, this would be, I think, phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are, do we have any last questions, uh, comment? We might have a, Time for one or two ones, but unless, let's just, uh, no, I just want to take this time to pass over to our speakers for any final comments uh, or kind of uh, questions between each other just before the last five minutes. So, uh, oh, uh, all the slides and everything and the videos will be available on the Padlet, which I'll share, but uh, the video will also be uploaded to our the UC YouTube channel and shared on Facebook. And I imagine uh, our partners from the University of Multiple will also want to share. But uh, so thank you for that question. Uh, I'll pass over quickly to Edward. Do you have any final thoughts or comments? Uh, um, thanks, Chris. Um, just, just taking from the Padlet, um, here we, we had some people saying, uh, what do you think science communicators need to do to be more inclusive and reach out to alternative audience? Says we had. Um, be as audience focused as possible, depth of engagement, not just reach. Um, go to audiences where they exist. There are multiple uh, online audiences as well. There are multiple um, platforms. Uh, this, this, I think, is a really good point. Um, there are some uh, chat um, systems out there, um, Discuss, I think, and, and some other ones, which um, I, I'm not part of. Uh, a lot of what I do is 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 actually try to empower the people who are, 
So I think it's really key, like get, getting to know the people who are already engaging these communities. Be either a, a researcher already working with develop the community, or you know, an an intern who is um, highly engaged on these these platforms. Um, and the other one was plenty of content marketing. That um, so I mentioned just just to cover the Padlet. Um, I've I've really enjoyed this. Uh, this discussion i think there's a lot more we can discuss um i wonder what people's thoughts are on on um you know how we can actually get these uh, and thank you for the kind words and take get these um best practices or things that um the evidence is showing us is effective uh, and and trying to share those with other science communicators and involving them also um worldwide um yeah that's that for me is like the take home thing to to think about um beyond targeting beyond um working with with those people who are already maybe part of that com community and thinking up of ways to empower them and to work with them also thank you very much edward uh eric was is there any final comments that you'd like to contribute uh, I just to uh, highlight the importance of empirical evaluation to test whether you are reaching the people that you think you're reaching. Uh, you know, it's uh, easy for us to kind of assume things are going well, and at some point, it's important to check with audiences in a scientifically robust way whether things are playing out as we hope. Perfect. Thank you very much, Eric. And uh, to Anna and Margesha, uh, sorry to clump you in together. Uh, you are two separate people, obviously, but you're just there in the same box. So we want to thank you for the opportunity for this very exquisite meeting today. That was a pleasure to share our experience with you. And uh, we hope that uh, our experience will help you as well. Uh, with other projects and and to, to make science festivals uh, better and better uh, every year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for being a part of this hotspot. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you for taking part. And uh, yeah, I just want to take this last moment just to uh, thank uh, our partners from uh, the University of Malta and especially Fran, sorry Ed, uh, for all your help in organizing this event and of course uh, to Jacek and for kind of putting us in contact with Anna and Margesha. Uh, also yes thank you to Eric for joining us and for Anna and Margesha of course and thank you for joining us as well. Uh, as we've said we have recorded this so we will make uh, all the resources available through the uh, UC social media pages and on the website. And yes, just want to thank you all very much for joining us and have a, in the UK, it's a super hot day. So I hope it's, uh, which is weird for the UK, but I hope everyone else has a lovely weekend and has a lovely rest of the day. So thank you for joining us. Cheers everyone. Have thank a, you very have a much. Day. Thanks for, for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you, Chris, for the great facilitation. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Entertaining as always. <laughs> Thank you.